Good morning, Jersey Life Church. How are we? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm so happy that everyone is here to, to worship with us. Um, let us stand to our feet, and as we stand, I'm going to pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for who you are and for what you have done for us. God, I, I pray that everyone here, that the, we came in with a heart that is postured towards worship so that we can look at you and see you for who you are and worship you all the more. In your son's name, amen. the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in all the King of glory, the King above all kings. Lift them up. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you will take my place. That you will bear my cross. You lay down your I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nation with truth and justice Shines like the sun and all of his brilliance The king of glory, the king above all kings Yeah, this is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place that you will bear my cross You lay down your life That I will be set free Whoa, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the king who conquered the grave Worthy is the lamb who was slain Worthy is the king who conquered the grave Worthy is the lamb who was slain Worthy is the king who conquered the grave Worthy is the lamb who was slain Worthy, worthy, worthy Amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you will take my place, that you will bear my cross, you lay down your life, 
give him a shout of praise. God is good, and all the time. So I'm Pastor Randy, for those of you who, just kidding. Um, only announcement that I have this morning is, as you can see, we have the Lord's table set here, and so we're going to be uh, joining in communion together this morning. We're actually going to uh, be doing that in small family groups. We're going to fan out through the, the building, and I'll give more specific instruction on that later. So family groups could be your biological family or your spiritual family, but gather with a few folks this morning and uh, find a space as we uh, bring the service to a close. But right now, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for so many things. We thank you for sending your son and we thank you for your presence with us. We thank you for the reality that as we journey through this life in the hard times and in the good times and anything in between that you're there with us. And we thank you this morning that we can trust that your presence is here. Help us to dwell in that today. Help us to give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Just as I am, I come. Hallelujah. Oh, what amazing love. Such amazing love. Thank you, Jesus. Just as I am, I come. 
Oh, hallelujah. Oh, what amazing love. Thank you, Jesus, just as I am. I love you Lord even though we come to you broken and hurted sometimes we even come to you as an, as an enemy but yet you receive us with open arms you take us just as we are Lord God you call yourself the great I am and yet you still take us for the broken people we are Great and broken shouldn't be in the same place, but Lord, surely you are here with us right now. Praise you. Praise you. I want to be close and close to your side. So heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above singing as one. Oh, hallelujah, holy, holy God almighty, the great I am and who worthy none beside thee God almighty the great I am I want to be near near to your heart loving the world and hating the dark I want to see dry bones Living again, singing as one. Oh, hallelujah! Holy, holy God Almighty, the great I am, who is worthy, none beside thee. God Almighty, you're the great I am. The great I am, the great I am, the great I am, the mountains shake before you, the demons run and flee. 
at the mention of your name king of majesty there is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great i am the great i am the great i am and shake before you the demons run and flee at the mention of your name king of majesty there is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great i am the great i am the great i am so amazing you are the great I am and we thank you for who you are and we thank you for being in this place and working in our lives in mysterious ways God God speak through Randy today allow allow Randy to just be a mouthpiece for you allow him to point everyone in this room up to you to the heavens where you are on the throne God you are amazing and we are in all of an awesome God your son's name amen you may be seated Yes, you are. Good morning, Jersey Life Church. <clears throat> Sociologist John P. Robinson is considered the father of time studies, literally worldwide. And he said that people in the 21st century in North America, you and me, we have upwards of 30 hours of leisure time each week. 30 hours of leisure time? What planet did this guy live on? Certainly not Earth, because on Earth we've got deadlines and to-do lists and obligations, projects to complete and places to go and people to meet and Facegram accounts to update and Instagram feeds to keep track of. We're busy. 30 hours of leisure time, that's crazy talk. But then again, there's been a lot of other crazy things said down through the course of history. Things like, you can have abundant life, or whatever burdens you have, you can lay them down and you can pick up peace and rest and exchange. Or how about this, for every six days that you work, you take a day completely off just to let your soul regenerate. Or how about this one, if you feel deflated, you can abound in hope. If your soul is weary and dry, it can be replenished replenished, abounding hope, rest, and peace in the deepest parts of who we are. Who would say such crazy things? Before we go any further, let's pause and pray to the one who did. 
Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you that you were the one who gave us such seemingly crazy things that seem so at odds with our culture where we run until we can run no more. Lord, we thank you for the reality that we can come into your presence and that we can be renewed and refreshed and replenished and we can be what you made us to be. Lord, this morning we just ask that you would be with us. As we dig into your word a little bit, that it would dig into us. As we lay it bare, that it would do the same to us. We want to be in your presence today. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, when you live in God's presence and you rejoice and enjoy his peace, you make your best decisions. You pray your best prayers. You love in a way that you don't have the human capacity to love. You're good with God and you're good with the world. But see, the opposite of that also then by default has to be true. That when you don't do it with his presence, that when you do it on your own, that you're dangerous. And that's a sad state to be in. Everybody around you knows it and you know it. And today I just want to help us simplify just a little bit to kind of pause, if we could, for a minute in our oh-so-busy lives and give our souls some breathing room. And what we're after is not more efficient use of time. What we're after is healthier souls, where we've given the Spirit room to breathe and to work. Because I believe stress and the pace at which we live life sometimes, and the reality that we think we're in charge and we're in control and we have to manage every situation, I believe that is both physically and spiritually killing us. There are so many health ailments directly related to it. Blood pressure and heart conditions, and now they're even tying cancer, and so many things related to something that we heap on ourselves. But beyond that, there's the emotional baggage and the financial and the relational and the professional and most importantly, the spiritual damage that it does. When the life that we're grasping for and struggling to acquire is only attainable through our strength, there's a problem. What is stress robbing from your life? Sound decisions don't get made when you're exhausted. They don't. Smart money management doesn't happen when you're exhausted. Meaningful connections with others, but most importantly with God, are impossible when we're not resting in his presence. And I think, man, this last couple of months and conversations that I've had, and I've kind of been on that merry-go-round or whatever you want to call the the wheel myself just a little bit. And in a lot of conversations, the same theme keeps flowing through to me. And it's not just the busyness. There's a bigger theme that keeps flowing through. I think too many people are desirous to step into God's presence for a spiritual pick stop, a quick fix, than they are to just pause and enjoy the peace that comes with his presence. Too many people are saying they're stressed out, but it's just a season even though they don't know when that season's going to end. Too many people are scattered in their thoughts and they never have an unhurried conversation. Is that you? You feel more run down and you know the culprit is stress. And the crazy thing is that list, we could add to it and it goes on and on, but Jesus has a better list. And we're going to go back to some of that crazy talk. Things like you can abound in hope because that's what you were created for. That we can live lives that are full of peace. 
that we can live lives that are victorious before we ever enter the battle. That's crazy. We can know that abundance. And instead of being busy and stressed and ragged and run down, we can be in a place of his presence and his peace and his rest. We can be well-paced and calm and rested. And I know it sounds crazy in this overextended society that we live in, but it's true. Stand with me this morning, if you will, and grab your Bibles or your iPhones or whatever it is. I didn't put it on the screen this morning. I decided I was making you guys lazy by just letting you read off the screen. We're going to be in Exodus, real easy to find. Genesis, Exodus, chapter 33. Genesis, I'm sorry, Exodus 33. We're going to pick up in verse 7. See a few people poking at iPhones, a couple pages turning, that's good stuff. We're going to be taking a little bit of a journey with Moses this morning. And as we pick up here in Exodus 33 in verse 7, It's kind of a key moment in Moses' journey. Let's read it together. I'm going to be reading from the NIV. It says, Now Moses used to take a tent, take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away. And it was called the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to that tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrances to their tents watching Moses until he entered the tent. And as Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they all stood and worshipped, each at the entrance of his tent. I love this. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. And then Moses would return to camp, but his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. And Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me to lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. Catch it. The Lord replied, my presence, my presence will go with you. And I will give you rest. That promise is key. Let us pray again. Lord, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you that it was captured by faithful servants and that it was guarded by those down through the generations and that it's still alive and speaks to us today. Lord, would you allow it to do just that? Would your word spring forth into our hearts and minds and souls this day. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. That is an awesome promise. Here's the backstory. Here's the reason for this little exchange between this guy named Moses, who we probably know a little bit about, and God. God has asked Moses to fill this key leadership role, and he's kind of had Moses in this leadership training program for his entire life. The grooming process has been taking place for a while, right? If we look back through the the account that unfolds before us there, primarily in Exodus, the conversation that we just saw took place after Moses was this little baby and he was born under this crazy leader of Egypt, Pharaoh, who decided to kill all the babies, but yet his mother puts him in this basket and puts him down along the Nile River and God decides to raise him up in Pharaoh's household where he'd be cared for and loved. 
This conversation that we just looked at takes place after Jesus, after Jesus, after Moses receives his call to ministry. This crazy call, he sees this bush burning, but it isn't consumed. And as he approaches it, God says, take off your shoes because the place where you stand is holy ground. And I'm here and I have something to say to you. This conversation that we just read, it happened after Moses was informed by God that he would be an instrument to deliver his people. It happens after this struggle takes place between Moses coming to Pharaoh and saying, let my people go, followed by the 10 plagues. You guys remember all that stuff, right? This conversation happens after the parting of the Red Sea and they go through on dry ground. This happens after so many things have come. This happens after the gift of the 10 commandments on Mount Sinai when God made a covenant with his beloved people, which flows down to us. Moses had racked up a lot of experience with God at this point, right? He wasn't wet behind the ears. He wasn't green. He was God's servant. And yet the thing that Moses says to God is, yes, I'll go, but only if your presence goes with me. Hmm. And here in chapter 33 of Exodus, God gives Moses two promises. Promises that provide access to the living water, to God himself. So my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. I just want to unpack those for a couple of minutes this morning. Moses was a man who was more concerned with God's will than his own. I mean, that's an easy sentence to say. It's a hard life to live. God spoke with Moses face to face as a man speaks with a friend. Can I just, I mean, I don't know. Sometimes I think we go too quickly past things in Scripture. You don't develop that kind of intimacy with God by popping in and out of his life. You don't develop that kind of intimacy with God by showing up only on Sunday morning and worshiping him and not spending time in his word and prayer throughout the course of the week. Moses has this amazing intimacy with God that, man, we should all be trying to achieve. And it doesn't happen just by tossing a few prayer requests his way when things are going bad in our lives and expecting intimacy to just automatically happen, this kind of relationship is cultivated. There's intention, and there's investment, and there's depth. And Moses sets up this tent outside the camp of the Israelites, and I don't know if you catch this, but this is like a really cool thing that's going on here. So when they need earthly guidance, they go to the tent with Moses, and Moses gets heavenly guidance to deal with earthly issues, how to deal with the problems that are in front of them. And because of their sin, the Israelites just didn't enjoy the same level of intimacy as Moses himself did. And I have to wonder, maybe like some people today, maybe they thought they had a better way. Actually, we know that's true, because just a chapter before this, in chapter 32, Moses comes down from Mount Sinai with two stone tablets. Literally, it says that they were engraved by the finger of God, the Ten Commandments. And when he comes down off this mountaintop experience with God, I mean, I can imagine how he felt. <coughs> and he comes down off the mountain... And like he finds his people ready to praise and worship. No, that's not what happens. He comes down and he finds a bunch of knuckleheads that have mounted, melted down all the gold that they had and they're worshiping a golden calf and they're getting drunk. And it says this amazing leader, whatever else you think of Moses, he was an amazing leader. 
when he walks back into that situation and he sees the chaos that has erupted, he sees the beloved people of God drunk, and he sees that they had been doing really stupid things, he loses it. I wonder what that looks like today. Maybe it's the student athlete who desires what God has for him, but, you know, life is just busy. There'll be another season when they can get in God's presence, right? Or maybe it's the 20 or 30-something that loves God, but there's a job and there's family and and their time is all consumed, but there'll be another season, right? Or maybe it's the mom who wants intimacy with God, but there are recitals and games and tournaments, but there'll be another season, right? Or maybe, maybe it's this, maybe it's the retiree who has extra time to serve but is loaded down with doctor's appointments and family trips and vacations they never took, but there'll be another season. Moses had spent his whole life following hard after God, and now the people that he's been tasked to lead are following hard after their own desires. And the Bible says this, It says that his anger burned. Moses, this amazing leader, what are you getting angry about? It says he smashed the tablets of the law, which symbolized the breaking of the people's covenant with God, and he burned the golden calf, and then he crushed it up into powder and made them drink it. You guys know this story. He called Aaron on the carpet, and he cleaned house. He insisted that everyone that had been involved in these riotous acts would pay. And in 3228, it says that 3,000 Israelites died that day. But why was he angry? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever processed that? Moses, listen, he wasn't angry because the people weren't doing what he said. That's not it. He wasn't angry because this display of deviance was bad PR for Israel. That had nothing to do with it. You want to know why Moses, this amazing leader, was angry? It's for the same reason that at times I get frustrated. Moses was angry because his people were going to miss God's best, and they were going to miss the blessing. Moses knew the intimacy that he had was something that needed to be cultivated, and it wasn't just going to happen. And when he came back down off this amazing experience on the mountain with God where he was given this covenant and found the people that he's leading so messed up. He saw his friends were chasing after their desires and not what God had for them. He wanted more for the people that he loved. He did. And if he were standing here today in my place, he'd want more for us too. As sure as I stand here, I'm sure of that. I think he would say things like this. God has been faithful to you. And even though there's been hard times, there's places that you can point to where you can see that. And God has given you an amazing family with beautiful children. And even though the hard times come, he wants you to have more. And you and you and you, what are the blessings that he's given us, church? What are the things that we should be celebrating? I think sometimes we're really quick to look at the places where it goes different than our plan. And all of a sudden we can slip down that place and kind of feel that God's abandoned us. God has not abandoned us. What blessings should we be praising him for? God has been faithful, church, and God will remain faithful. What stories should we be telling? In the same way that God protected the baby Moses, floating him in this little basket along the Nile, in the same way that God protected and provided for a teenage Moses as a Jew in Egypt and Pharaoh's court, 
In the same way that God redeemed and restored and renewed and revived Moses all throughout his life, God has shown up for us. Hasn't he? Hasn't he done great things in our midst, individually and collectively? I think Moses was so irritated back then, that same Moses would be irritated today. Because he wants us to know that deep down in our souls that God has not, will not abandon. And he wants us to spend more time rejoicing than feeling sorry for ourselves. He wants us to know that tomorrow is better than yesterday. God's faithfulness cannot be beat. And sometimes we find the reality that <clears throat> we fill our lives so full of stuff that we just don't have time to appreciate all he is and says and does. I would venture to say that most people sitting here this morning have trusted God with their lives. And if we can trust him with our lives... Why can't we trust him with the hours and the minutes? Why can't he be given that place where the thing that's going to happen next or the thing that's happening now gets as much trust from us as our eternal salvation? Because it's the same God. I want us to hear the faithfulness that comes through in these words. One of the ending part of that verse that I pointed out, I love the reality that God will not only go with us, but he'll give us rest. Peace is equivalent to that. Peace through rest. The word that we use sometimes is Sabbath. I want us to hear this morning what Moses, I believe, is saying to us down through the ages. I want us to hear the reality that I think Moses is saying, if you want that level of intimacy that I have, then you need to build your own tent. And you need to take your own time to dwell there in God's presence. Commune with God like we're going to do here in just a few minutes. Don't let anything get in your way. Lay down your burdens and your to-do list and the cares and concerns and worries of tomorrow. Lay down the projects that you need to complete and your agendas and pick up freedom and abundance instead. Let God dictate for a while the pace of your life and the use of your days. Honor the one who created you by taking the Sabbath rest that he created you for. The verb Shabbat literally means to rest from our labors, a day of rest. And it's first mentioned all the way back in Genesis 2. On the seventh day, God had finished the work of creation, so he rested from his work. Can I just offer you like a very rudimentary understanding God wasn't tired. He was patterning for us a way of life. He was saying, yes, work is a gift and I want you to do it. And it's a blessing, not a curse that we sometimes think of it as. But after you do that each week, take time in this pattern and rest. And in that rest, find the God who created rest. And the funny thing is that it's not just there though, right? This concept of Sabbath, it's referenced 63 times in 22 different books of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. It's in all five books of the law that Moses wrote. It's in all four of the Gospels. It's important to God. It should be important to us. We are solemnly charged to remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy. Our bodily welfare needs it. And maybe more important, our spiritual body presence needs it. F.W. Robertson said this. He said, the Sabbath lies 
deep in the everlasting necessities of human nature. And he goes on to say this, the soul withers without it. It thrives, your soul thrives in proportion to its observance. What that tells us is that eternal things are impacted by earthly things. That's important. Big changes start with little changes. Uncluttering your soul begins with uncluttering an hour and a day. Beginning today, what if we didn't take the normal approach? What if we didn't wake up every morning weighted down by the things that we had to get done? What if we woke up every morning with this question, who am I created to be? I don't know the specifics of what that might mean to you in your life, but what I do know is this, that when we choose to go with God, there will be an adventure, there will be divine protection, and there will be a deep-seated sort of satisfaction that bubbles up in us that we cannot produce on our own. When you're living life in God's will, that's what happens. Who is God asking you to become? Will you arrange your schedule around that? Will you plan your days not according to your priorities, but according to God's will? Follow divine promptings in order that you would begin to walk in the presence of God in the way that he wants you to. Will you take time to schedule that time with God? See, I could guess at it a little bit, right? I'm too busy. I get it. You know, this is more to me. I'm just letting you guys listen. But I don't know what's keeping you exactly from living a simplified life. But I guess that you do. And I know that God does. The two of you just need to get together and sort it out. Maybe that's part of what you're going to want to do as we spend some time in communion this morning. Seek God's presence and peace. We're going to put some music on in here in just a second as I wrap up. We're going to take communion together and spend some time with God in prayer. I'd submit that there's more time available in our weeks than we think. I know for sure that God is here and wants to meet with you today. Do you want to invest your time in the wisest of ways? As we start today to chart a new course, perhaps, let's try to seek to have our soul refreshed. I hope you do that. I mean, I really honestly hope you do that. Let's ask God to help us to start anew and afresh. Let's seek his strength and let's go in his presence. But we can only do that if we go according to his will. And let's get the peace that comes with his rest. Let me pray. Father, we thank you today. We love you today. And we are in awe of you today. Lord, we thank you that your word is still true and that it rings out. And that it's got a message for us. For me. And Lord, as we take this time now to prepare to enter into your presence in a special way, we just ask that we're able to hear that still small voice resonating clearly in our minds and in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask Pastor Mark to come and help me serve this morning. Communion or the Lord's Supper or Eucharist, all different ways that we describe what we're about to participate in here. The word Eucharist literally means thanksgiving. Got so much to be thankful for, church. Even in the worst of days, we got so much to be thankful for. So we're going to choose to do that today because it's a choice. We're going to be thankful for his presence and his peace. And what better way to show gratitude than to participate in this symbolic meal that we're about to participate in? 
And as we prepare to come this morning, can we do that with hearts that have already decided to be grateful? He loves us. He's done so much for us. We're thankful for the reality that we can be loved as a child of God. We're thankful for the reality that he demonstrates his love for us. And this morning, we're going to take communion as a body of believers here together. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to do it slightly different, maybe. I don't know that there's been a one way, and that's kind of a good thing. What we're going to do is um, I'm going to be holding the loaf representing Jesus' body, and Pastor Mark is going to have the cup representing his blood. I'm going to ask you all to come up on my right, your left, line up over here, and as you do... We're going to worship God with our tithes and offerings as we come. I'm going to give you the body. Pastor Mark will give you the blood. Find a space, whether it's in here or wherever. Probably not the bathroom, that's weird. Somewhere in the building. Get together with your biological family or your spiritual family or some combination thereof in small groups. Wait till everybody's there. Get in God's presence. Enjoy God's peace. And take the communion together. This is such an amazing opportunity that we have. I can't give you the explanation because I don't fully comprehend it. But what I do know is there's something that special that takes place at this table. God's presence is always with us, but he promises in these places like communion where he's given us that instruction in scripture that his presence will be there. We refer to it as a means of grace or a sacrament, meaning that he literally meets us there and meters out, gives us more grace. Let's just fully appreciate that together today as family. Let's enjoy his presence, enjoy his peace, enjoy the grace that he wants us to have. Let me pray over the elements and then I'm going to ask us to come. So on that night, as our Lord sat in the upper room, sat with his disciples and he said, this is my body, take and eat. And as we come this morning, let us join him. Let us enjoy his presence as we take this symbol of the broken body. And then as the meal continued on, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the remission of sins. What an opportunity we have this morning to be able to be obedient to our Lord and Savior and to enjoy his peace and his presence. The Lord's table is set. Let us come. Let's come from this way. So we're going to sing this last song. Feel free to stay where you're at. Stay with your uh, biological, spiritual family. Just be together. Come to the altar. Be crowded by your family. Be, Be lavished love upon. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling.
Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing alleluia, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing alleluia, Christ is risen. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. As we prepare to leave here this morning, I hope that those words continue to resonate. Moses, the faithful servant, asks 
and receives the promise that God's presence would go with him as long as he walked where God would have him walk and that his peace would give him rest. That's my prayer for us, not only as we leave here today, but in general. Let me pray. Father, we thank you so much that your words are true and that your presence is sweet. And that if we'll just lean into that and it will seek your will and we'll seek that intimacy that will have that presence that comes with that refreshing peace. Let us be people of peace and people of your presence both today and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Go and be the church.